God is light, in whom there is no darkness at all. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world. And we loved darkness rather than light. Almighty Father, look with mercy on this your family, for which our Lord Jesus Christ was content to be betrayed and given up into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who is alive and glorified with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. This is the wood of the cross on which hung the Saviour of the world. Come, let us worship. O Saviour of the world, who by your cross and precious blood have redeemed us, save us and help us, we humbly pray. O God, you know my foolishness, and my sins are not hidden from you. Lord, have mercy. Let not the flood overwhelm me, nor the depths swallow me up. Let not the pit shut its mouth upon me. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Hear me, O Lord, as your loving kindness is good. Turn to me as your compassion is great. <coughs> Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Holy God, Holy and strong, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. Amen. No. Our choir anthem oh. today is There is a Green Hill Far Away.
a reading from the Gospel according to Mark. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that If it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me. Yet, not what I want, but what you want. And a reflection on this passage by Stephen Cottrell. I liked him when he was strong, turning over tables, casting out demons, catching the scribes in the snare of his rhetoric. He was strong even when kneeling down and washing feet. When he was strong, I was strong, and it was joy to follow him. Oh, don't get me wrong, following him wasn't easy, I didn't understand him, but he made me feel good about myself and good about the world. He brought hope, a stability and a purpose that was lacking everywhere else. And I liked it that the religious and the powerful felt the same way too, only what was joy to me was a terrible threat for them. But I believed in him. I believed that he could even overcome their power. So I followed, only at a distance. I'm not Peter or John, nor even Mary. But I see something in him that I want so badly in me. I want my demons cast out. I want my feet washed. I want him to sweep away the junk and corruption in my life. And I want his stories to be true. Those wonderful stories of hope and forgiveness and of a God who loves me. So it isn't easy to see him weak, to see him scared. The others are all asleep. But he is awake with a restless agitation. He sees what is coming, but he wishes it were different. I know this feeling too, knowing where you must go, yet longing for another way. Lord, have mercy. Holy God, holy and strong, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. Jesus, betrayed by Judas and arrested. Immediately, while he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, and with him there was a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. So when he came, he went up to him and at once said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid hands on him and arrested him. They laid hands on him. Here's the thing. If Judas hadn't betrayed him, someone else would have. Everyone was anxious. Everyone knew that things had to come to a head. So 
it was like he wanted someone to hand him over. And we got to thinking that maybe if we did, if someone did, then this was the chance he needed to show the people who he really was. So we didn't get in the way. He told us he was from God. We even started to believe it, that he might be the Messiah we had been waiting for. After all, don't we all long for God to come to us? So this was his chance, a chance to demonstrate his power, a chance to weave the magic of his words, the ones that had so entranced us. But it isn't working out that way. So it is convenient to dump the blame on Judas, even when the truth is far more complicated, far more uncomfortable, because I have betrayed him. I have betrayed him in a thousand little ways by all my acts of egocentric self-promotion, by my failure to love and by my refusal to wash feet, because I want things my way, not his. He taught me that I will gain life by losing it, but I can't accept that. I still cling on to what I've got and I'm ready to dump him if necessary. Lord, have mercy. Holy God, holy and strong, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many gave false testimony against him, and their testimony did not agree. Some stood up and gave false testimony against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. But even on this point their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But he was silent and did not answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, why do we still need witnesses? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? All of them condemned him as deserving death. He wouldn't really answer their questions. That frustrated us as much as them. We wanted him simple. We wanted him plain, but he comes to us all in the frail, undignified, vulnerability of flesh. I am. That's what he kept on saying. I am the bread. I am the vine. I am the truth. I am the way. That was all he had to say when they arrested him. I am he. And it was all they needed him to say to kill him. For these are the words that God said to Moses when he refused to answer his questions straight. I am who I am. I will be what I will be. So they didn't look for anything else. They missed the overwhelming silence of his presence before them, which was, if they could have seen it, the breath 
that is taken between one movement of the dance ending and another about to start. I didn't see it either. I too was disillusioned. I too was unprepared for the music he would sing. Though I am learning that he is like bread, broken. And he is like wine, poured. And he is a truth I never dreamed of. He is a way I find it hard to follow. How is it that the way to life leads straight to dying? Lord, have mercy. At that moment, the cock crowed for the second time. Then, Peter, remembering that Jesus had said to him, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. Peter. 
Peter got it right for once. He said he didn't know him. He said it wasn't him. That was how we were all feeling. We didn't know him. We weren't with him anymore. We thought he would vindicate himself. Wasn't that what everything else had been leading? How could we think otherwise when he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey just like the prophets said? Or when he declared that the temple would be torn down and rebuilt in three days? But now we just feel stupid and scared. He wasn't the Messiah. We didn't really know him at all. Maybe we never had. And that's how I feel at the moment. I feel stupid. I feel scared. I feel like I don't know him and can't follow him. But I can't let go of him either. I keep thinking that something else will happen that will make sense of all this senselessness. When the cock crows, it isn't just Peter who's reminded of his failing. I know with the dawn of each new day that I am not the person I am meant to be, that I have much to learn about love, that his words of peace and forgiveness have not yet entered my soul and changed me, so that even if I was led away like him, I could keep on loving. Lord, have mercy. Pilate asked them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Pilate wasn't interested in bread, nor in those enigmatic declarations that had so enraged the scribes. He was after truth. And like all weak men, especially those with too much power, he wanted a truth that would set him free, free from responsibility, that is. So when he realised that he couldn't bargain with Jesus, he made friends with the crowd. And they, all too predictably, bayed for blood in return. That was, after all, the usual price. Did I say they? Did I pretend I wasn't in the crowd? Did I try to give the impression I was standing at the edge a mere observer, don't believe it. I too love to run with the crowd and feel the exhilaration of a moral certainty that can crush another. I too love to count some in and rule others out. Of all people, I am to be most pitied. I cannot even muster up the courage to confess my sins, too proud to be forgiven. Why, I'd rather burn in hell than face the embarrassment of my actions. <coughs> I am just like Pilate. I don't want to be responsible. I don't want to have to be <coughs> forgiven. And even as I say this, as my shrinking heart becomes less willing to be touched by love, I cry out, where can I find transfusion for my heart? Where can I find irrigation for my dried up soul? Where is the blood and water I crave?
Lord, have mercy. And they clothed him in a purple cloak, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him. And they began saluting him, Hail, King of the Jews! <coughs> they struck his head with a reed, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak, and put his own clothes on him. Then... They led him out to crucify him. There is no easy way of carrying a cross. There's no handle. Its weight is sharp and crushing. Its meaning obvious. Those clever men who devise such clever ways of killing, perfected with these beams of wood a tortuous cycle of almost unremitting suffering. The crucified man, switching weight from nailed ankles to nailed wrists, buying time, relieving pressure, eking out the hours so that sometimes crucifixions would go on for days. It meant the crowds got their money's worth and that was no small consideration. Obedience was demanded and it was exacted through fear and your own self-righteousness could be coddled with a morbid spectacle of someone else's dying. It was therefore an additional indignity to be made to carry the cross like having to fumble with the rope to tie the knot of your own noose. But he carried it well, tramping through the crowded lanes around Jerusalem, seeing the crazy chaos of the crowd, hearing their abuse and their grief. Everyone loves a good killing, as long as it's not your own. And he carried so many other things as well, our sins, our sorrows, and a million disappointments about all the ways that we'd got him wrong. And these were heavier still. Lord, have mercy. Holy God, holy and strong, holy and immortal, have mercy on us.
they compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. When he stumbled for a third time, the crossbeam he was carrying, thumping heavily to the ground, even those who mocked him held their breath. Was the spectacle going to end before it had properly started? Were they to be cheated of a nice long death? The soldiers were impatient. They had work to do and homes to go to. Someone was going to have to help. Their eyes scanned the crowd. Whom should they pick? And we all averted our gaze, begging the God we did not believe in to pick someone else. And the one who was chosen, do not think of him as a volunteer. His eyes were down just like mine. He was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Just not quite enough to hide. And they dragged him roughly to the front and gave him the cross to carry. And its splinters pierced his flesh too. It was Simon in town from Cyrene. You know, Alexander and Rufus's dad. Who would have believed that? For somehow carrying that cross, albeit reluctantly, changed him. He says, if you can get a word in edgeways, that he has never put it down. And so I wonder, why didn't they pick me? I, who am neither volunteer nor recruit, still stand on the edge, wondering what holding a cross feels like. Lord, have mercy. Holy God, holy and strong, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what each would take. When we die, we relinquish control of all our possessions, all the things that seemed to be so important are laid down. They pass to others or are simply bagged up and disposed of. <coughs> I may be very firmly attached to this piece of jewellery, a wedding ring perhaps, or to this item of clothing. This may be something that cherished something, something I would rescue from the burning house. But in death, I am detached from it. Even my most precious and familiar possessions, the very flesh I occupy, no more than that, the flesh and blood that I know to be me, without which I cannot conceive that there is a me, is taken. The spirit that imbues my flesh dragged out of it. When they had nailed him to the cross, his arms and legs secure, and the terrible cycle of dying had begun, the soldiers simply sat as if at rest, though I suppose on guard and laughing, drew lots for his clothes. With this, his death really began, and I could see that it was my death as well. Oh yes, in all probability, I had some years to idle away before the actual moment came. 
but as they rolled the dice for his clothes, I looked at mine and at my flesh and at the bones beneath it, and I saw it all slipping away into oblivion. Only the laughter of those who mocked remained, and his crying out. Lord, have mercy. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. His mother stood there all afternoon and he commended her to those who loved him. She stood as near to death as she was permitted. She did not avert her gaze. She did not flinch. The tears that would erupt were held against the levy of her determined vigil. It was as if a sword pierced her heart too when they pierced his. They saw each other like sons do with mothers and mothers do with sons. They couldn't embrace, but they were held together in the vice-like grip of love. And those who saw it knew it could not be undone. In his dying, and his reaching out to those from whom he had learnt human love, we see what love looks like. Love is not a remedy, not a good luck charm. Love is not falling in love. Love is the costly and determined insistence to stick with what is right and to patiently go on standing by those you love. It was what was most infuriating that afternoon for those who wanted to rid themselves of him, even for my own embarrassed relief that following him might be over at last. He went on loving. He loved those who nailed him to the cross. He loved those who hung beside him. He loved those who mocked and derided him. He knew that the only way to conquer such evil was to love it to submission. Lord, have mercy.
Three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, listen, he's calling for Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. There is a final ignominy that no one expected. A last gasp, gallows humour to keep the sketch writers happy. As he dies, he cries out, My God, why have you deserted me? Isn't this what they wanted to have? What they wanted to hear? That the fancy preacher, with all his faux humility and big claims, was 
just another lost soul screaming out to God in despair and battering his fists upon the locked doors of heaven. But no one understands him like they never did. They think he's calling Elijah. They don't hear his desolation, still less construe what I began to glimpse, that this howl of grief is the final plumbing of the depths of all that darkness, that his light comes to dispel. And here on this hill, on this cross, on this afternoon, the tectonic plates of the universe shift and we are reconciled to God. God is in this dying man and in this dying man experiencing the horrors and the grief and all the fears and isolation that is the daily currency of sin and death. For now, I can even see myself in him. He is dying for me. And in sharing in this death and in the consequence of sin, by succumbing to it, drawing the sting of its venom, all of it and forever, and in loving it, it is defeated. So the dying man gives up his spirit. It is finished, he says. Lord, have mercy. Holy God, holy and strong, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. Then Joseph bought a linen cloth and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. He then rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Silence, darkness, there is a chill in the air. They have taken his body down from the cross and wrapped it in a shroud and laid it in a borrowed tomb, hewn out of the rock and rolled a stone in front of the entrance. There is nothing left to do, nothing to say. The Sabbath is beginning. There are things to attend to important religious observances to be kept. The crowds disperse, unsatisfied by death. Once again, it has failed to do anything to prevent their own, or has it? I too amble away, wondering what I have seen and what it means and what I'm supposed to do next. There are some things in life that can only be understood by standing under. The cross is one of them. It cannot be explained away. It cannot be brushed aside. It cannot be avoided. You either have to be nailed to it yourself, 
carrying it with you, learning its meaning day by day and step by step, or you have to walk away and find another route through life. It will not go away, however. It stands at the centre of the universe and in a great light. And wherever you run, you will always find yourself doused in its shadow. Lord, have mercy. Holy God, holy and strong, holy and immortal, have mercy upon us.
have mercy. Holy God, holy and strong, holy and immortal, have mercy upon us.